So this story really starts five days before. Uh, Larry, who's on our trip, uh, ex-CSI Toronto cop, uh, retired. And uh, he was finding the trip pretty tough. Uh, although we were running most of the rapids, uh, any portages we had to do really kind of knocked him down and he would end up in his tent early every evening. So on day five, um, Gary, the leader of the trip, um, was a little concerned and he decided to uh, pull into this hunt camp uh, just short of uh, LSAT. And luckily, uh, they actually had a phone because uh, they're only about two, three K from the uh, rail line. And the owners weren't there, but there were some guests there and they allowed us to use the phone. So Gary J, the leader of the trip, uh, got on the phone with the OPP, you know, gave him the situation that his friend Larry uh, was laboring, blah, blah, blah. So they instructed him to call Orange um, and I guess they transferred the call or something. And then they put Larry on the call and we can, we're all listening intently, you know, you can hear a pin drop in the room, this little cabin. And you could hear the lady's voice on the other side of the phone as Larry was explaining, yeah, I've got a chest pain on my right, uh, my left side, uh, you know, going through all the symptoms. And you could hear the lady clearly say, sir, you're having a heart attack. So then um, we decided, or they decided basically to um, send um, a rescue or evac'd and we gave them the coordinates because we had gps of where we were we exit the building you know call lands we exit the building realize you really can't land a helicopter here there's trees there's not much shoreline um and it's windy uh, there's obstacles like uh, cables and all kind of stuff around boats and ramps and all kind of stuff so we go back in, we try to get back in touch with Orange. We get in touch with, uh, I believe, OPP or Orange, I can't remember now. Um, and we said, we're going to Ilsa, uh, which is about two, three K um, down the river, down the lake. Our paddling partner, Richard, um, had some knowledge because about 25 years before, he was one of the persons on the crew that actually cut the Chapelo River portage trails for the MNR. And he says 25 years ago, there was this kind of town, kind of an abandoned town at the rail line. And there's a big open grass area. And I go, Richard, are you sure? I mean, it's 25 years ago. There could be like mature trees there now. And he says, no, no, it was a town. And it looked like it was pretty open. Okay. So we go back in call back, give them the new coordinate. We all jump in the canoe and the plane or helicopter or whatever. We're not sure what's coming. Um, it's coming from Timmins, so it's gonna be at least 45 minutes. So we figured that two, three K we can make it to the town and uh, hopefully it all works out. So we get there where there's a dock. Um, we're looking around. It's an abandoned town. There is nothing here except kind of looks like cottages, but there's nobody here. And we're talking July, first week of July. So, you know, you would expect people to be here. Nope, there's nobody. Um, so we walk around, can't find anybody. We decide, okay, we'll go close to the rail line. Uh, so we're waiting. It's a kind of an overcast gray sky. We actually shot up a flare because we heard a plane coming and we figured, oh man, they got the message or they didn't get the message that we moved. So we'll send a flare up. So we send a flare up and it's kind of like a white flare and a white cloudy sky. So who knows if they saw it. Anyways, um, we hear sounds like a chopper getting closer and finally clears um, the tree line and uh, you know, spots us and uh, basically lands. Later on, I talked to the pilot and I asked him if he saw the flare and he said, nope. 
but he saw the canoes um, so that was his clue to uh, come to the town the message did not get through he was going for the hunt camp which was 2k away so luckily uh, there was enough visibility to see us where to land, I suspect, and uh, confirm where the party that he's looking for. And then he returned and actually uh, did the approach landing. I'm going to put in the field. about a meter high at some point and I think just hovering there you could push the grass away and see if there's any obstacles. So the helicopter lands and uh, the crew is getting set up <clears> to <throat> head over and ask uh, Larry a bunch of questions of course, kind of repeating what we already know. And then they decide um, to put him in the helicopter and plug him in. Uh, he's got like, uh, I don't know, about 10 different wires coming off him as you can see and they get them all set up and all he can bring with him is a small day pack so then the helicopter spools up and uh, heads on off to Timmins Larry after his experience wrote an article that appeared in the Nostalgan uh, 2015 summer journal I'll let the narrator tell the story. My trip down the Chaplo by Larry Hicks July was hot. Really hot. It's taken us two sweaty days to get here. Three of us jammed into Gary's J car with enough gear for a two week canoe trip. We ate in restaurants and diners along the way, knowing our diet for the next while would be bush fare. I for one welcome Tim Hortons. I was facing two weeks of Gary's J coffee. We struck out across Racine Lake in the early morning, wanting to make time before it got really hot. We were doing fine until we got to the other side. No river. No portage. Were we lost? The GPS said we're in the right spot. So we humped, dragged, and hacked our way cross-country through a tangle of fallen trees, thick bush and rocks until we found open water. We just skirted one of the biggest, overgrown log jams I'd ever seen. And on one of the hottest days I can remember. A couple of lakes, rapids, and portages later we reached our campsite. We were beat. Darkness was approaching and it was still hot. We tanked up with water, ate supper, and tanked up again. Have to stay hydrated. Three sweaty dudes in their underwear lying on top of their sleeping bags in a small steamy tent is not conducive to a good night's sleep. Someone was snoring, I blamed Richard. An elbow from Gary J suggested that perhaps I was awakened by my own snoring. I got up the next morning and had a good pee. Nice color. Satisfied that I was not dehydrated, I had two cups of Gary's J famous coffee with breakfast. Off we went. Great white water, short portages, and good fellowship, but boy was it hot. 
I drank about three liters of water that day, sweating it out as fast as I could take it in. What should have been an easy portage for me became a bit of a slog. I was tired and dragging my feet. I stumbled a couple of times and did a really good face plant with a heavy barrel on my back. I went to bed early that night, after the customary top up of water and a little merlot. I woke up the next day still feeling tired and listless. My trip mate seemed concerned about my failing condition as each time we stopped for a break, someone would pass me a water bottle. Maybe I am dehydrated? Drink more water. Then I started to have a stabbing pain in the left side of my chest. Did I break a rib when I fell yesterday? Am I having the big one? The team decided to pull me out. We paddled to Nemagozanda, found a phone in a fishing lodge and Gary J called his contact in the op. He handed me the phone. On the other end was a guy from Orange saying they were coming to get me, and for me to chew some aspirin. I packed a change of clothes into my small pack and told the guys to share the rest of my stuff. In retrospect, I should have taken the flask of whiskey with me. We paddled across the lake to Elsa's where a field provides a landing spot for a helicopter. The wind was howling and the waves were high, but we beat the helicopter there. The crew was in a rush because of the approaching storm and made good time getting out of there. I worried about my trip mates traveling back to Chaplow short a paddler, but after a shot of Demerol I forgot all about them. But I do remember lying on my back in the ER in Timmins and the doctor telling me this is a heart attack. I spent two days in the hospital. The medication they gave me settled my heart down but I wasn't improving overall. They must have eventually figured it out as they started me on potassium pills. Big ones. I started to get better quickly. After another day, they decided to let me go. My wife drove me all the way home to Toronto in one of the worst rainstorms in Ontario history. I worried about my trip mates in this weather but was relieved to hear from Gary J that they took the train back from Elsa's. It wasn't until my final interview with the doctor in Timmins that I understood fully what happened to me. The direct cause. My heart was acting up because my potassium levels were critically low, a condition known as hypokalemia. Potassium is an electrolyte essential to cardiac and other bodily functions. Although my heart responded well to the initial medication, they kept me the extra days out of concern for my kidneys. The immediate cause. I was drinking and passing so much water that I literally flushed the electrolytes out of my system. They have to be replaced on a constant basis, normally through the food you eat. Supplements work well too, but sugary drinks like Gatorade come with their own set of problems. The pain in my chest is believed to be from fluid buildup in my lung. The early cause. I take a low-dose diuretic pill daily to help keep my blood pressure down. Diuretics work by removing excess fluid from your system. Together with Gary's J Coffee, this may have accelerated my fluid loss. The prevention. I now carry whole potatoes and canned spinach with me on trips. I am what I am. Your pack will be noticeably lighter by the end of the trip too. My thanks to everyone who helped me through this adventure. Go easy on the water. This article appears in the Nastog in 2015 summer issue.